Brilliant. Uh, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Terry Chiplin, and uh, I'm the event director for the US Trail Running Conference and also for this webinar series that comes up, comes under the conference umbrella. And uh, delighted to uh, have three, uh, three esteemed colleagues with me on the webinar this afternoon um, or this morning, depending on where in the world you are. And uh, um, actually we have some international um, people. Um, I don't know if they'll be uh, dialing in or not, but, uh, um, but certainly, uh, uh, certainly if they are, then uh, we welcome uh, all comers from uh, all around the world. Um, and uh, but mostly the United States and Canada, so uh, um, that's where most of our participants are. Um, myself, I'm in England, so uh, hence the reference this afternoon. It's uh, um, we still have daylight here. It's just on five, five o'clock in the evening, uh, and uh, um, I've moved uh, last November from Colorado, from Estes Park in Colorado. So uh, um, a bit of a different home for me here. Um, so great to be with you, and uh, um, please feel free to uh, to use the. Uh, um, uh, to use the chat um, function and just say hi and uh, um, let us know you're out there. Um, and uh, um, um, actually, Peter, would you mind just uh, um, dropping something in the chat just to make sure it's working? Um, so I know, I think with that, we had a little problem with that the, the last time. Oh, there we go, Q and A. Okay. Oh, chat seems to be disabled. Oh, thank you, Nance. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I think that's something I need to, uh, um, I need to work on with, uh, uh, with Zoom for sure. So um, if chat's not working, then uh, feel free to, uh, to log any comments on Q&A and I'll do my best to, uh, um, to work through that. Um, so um, without further ado, um, I will... Oops. No, that was the wrong one. Okay, I'm going to share a screen. And so let's just get the right one. Okay, brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you guys. Okay, appreciate your patience here. It, the, uh, the first one of the year is always a little bit kind of clunky to get going, but, uh, um, but hey, what can we do? Um, so um, um, yeah, our webinar series. So um, uh, delighted to, uh, to share that uh, Marathon Printing are our uh, presenting sponsor again for the webinar series again this year. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, Marathon Printing, for, uh, for those who don't know, um, then uh, Marathon Printing is, uh, um, is a company, family owned company. Um, I've been working with them for a number of years. Um, they've, uh, um, they've also been a, uh, an ATRA event standards partner um, for a number of years too. And uh, um, they're probably best known for, uh, for their bibs. And uh, so the um, custom printed items for um, endurance sports, race bibs are most popular, um, either custom printed or stock bibs. Um, but they also supply vital accessories for race directors like pins, bags, and pennant flags, as well as postcards, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, and labels. Um, they've been a loyal supporter of the US Trail Running Conference since 2015. And they're also, as I mentioned, the event standard par par partner for ATRA. And uh, very grateful to, to Ryan Zirk and the team um, at Marathon Printing and uh, um, I really encourage all of you out there um, to, uh, to reach out to them. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and uh, uh, they'll be uh, happy to hear from you, I'm sure. Um, so I will get back to the screen share. Here we go. Okay, so. From here, we're uh, um, we're going to be uh, um, we're going to be talking today about race courses, um, design, marking, safety, and communications, and uh, we're going to aim to finish up at uh, about uh, as close to six p.m. GMT as we can. Uh, and I'm uh, delighted to, uh, as I mentioned, have uh, um, three three esteemed colleagues. A um, uh, quick bit of housekeeping: we'll, um, if you have any questions on the way through, then feel to feel free to add that to the Q and A, um, and uh, I will get chat sorted for the uh, for the next webinar. Um, and uh, um, Amy Ruziecki, and uh, so top of the tree there. Um, uh, Amy, if you could do a, a brief introduction for yourself, I know we got some uh, um, some of you pedigree here, but uh, um, if you could just say hi and give a brief intro. Sure. So I'm Amy Rizeki. Um, I'm joining you guys from Western Massachusetts. Uh, so uh, yeah, we got we got a couple inches of snow last night. Um, so I'm finally looking at some white ground. Uh, it's been pretty bare here all winter long. Um, anyway, so I race direct the Vermont 100 
um, and the Seven Sisters Trail Race. And then I have a bunch of other kind of, a bunch of other races that if you don't live in Western Mass, you probably have never heard of. Um, and I do, uh, with the exception of Vermont 100, all of my other races are under the Beast Coast Trail Running label. Hi. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Steve, you're next up. Um, yeah, if you could do the, uh, do the same honors, that'd be great. Hi everybody, I'm Steve Adderholt. I am the race director of the Cocodona series, uh, which is the Cocodona 250, Sedona Canyons 125, and Elden Crest 36 miler. I'll take place the first week in May in Arizona. Uh, I also oversee the Park City Point to Point mountain bike race um, and happy to be here. Thanks, Terry. Okay, brilliant. And Peter. Yes, thanks for having me, Terry. <clears throat> yeah, we, I'm in Manitou Springs at the moment, um, and we did get a lot of snow as well, and uh, which is good and bad, but should be 50 in the next two days, so that's, that's the good part. Whoa. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a former race director of multiple races, um, I think since the pandemic, and I, I'm assuming everyone felt it, that it, things have um, got a little wild, but um, yeah, I was uh, the race director for the Bar Trail Mountain Race here in Manitou Springs, um, Xterra Trail Races, Trail Runs, which was uh, multiple races uh, in Colorado specifically. And um, I also did some Spartan until the pandemic sort of disrupted that majorly. And uh, I also work with the American Trail Running Association so going to events and um, all over the country, world sometimes. Glad cool. to be here. Cool. Thank you, guys. I'm, we're, uh, um, so I'm going to be the uh, um, moderator, uh, for want of a better term, for, uh, uh, for this webinar. And uh, um, what, uh, what I did, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, um, uh, that I asked each of our panelists for their top three tips um, for um, that they can share with you. And uh, so that's what we're going to be doing as we go through here. So we're going to be starting with design, then markings, then safety, then communications. Um, and uh, so, and yeah, Q&A, if, uh, um, if you do have any questions on the way through, then feel free to, um, to add them to the Q&A section. Um, and uh, um, Amy, this looks like a picture of you actually in, in Vermont. Is, is this at the 100 or somewhere else? Yeah, this is... Uh... I think there's kind of two ways that people typically see me at a race and it's either, you know, something like this, which is, you know, giving a pre-race speech to a whole bunch of people um, with a red face because I've probably been running around all day uh, and stressing out. Uh, it's either that or they see me at the finish line. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. And then, Steve, this is, uh, um, I was trying to think back where, where this is from. Um, I, know it's, I know it's a couple of years ago now, isn't it? But uh, where was this picture taken? Uh, this was, I was struggling at this point. It's the Wasatch 100. I'm, it's oh. near mile 50. Okay. It was a, that was a tough day, but, uh, yeah, that's, it was that. You, you're struggling with, but with a smile on your face. That's the way we got to do it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> nice. And Peter, this, uh, um, this is a picture of you with, uh, one, one, maybe your second or third favorite occupation, but, uh, um, yeah, yeah, blogging, blogging. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, out in um, Del Norte, Colorado, and uh, running with uh, friend uh, Laura Hayfley, and I started picking up trash as I always do yeah. on runs, and he took a photo of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been interesting. Uh, um, have quick aside here that on my runs out in England, that uh, um, plugging is something that's uh, required here as well. Um, so uh, I've been doing some of that too. So uh, um, yeah, nice, nice picture. Thank, thanks for that reminder, Peter. Okay, yeah. so looking at um, course design. So Amy, you're you're first up. Your uh, um, your top three tips. So uh, um, take it away and uh, um, okay. yeah, share share your expertise. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'll preface everything that I'm saying that um, I, I think kind of in looking through the slides. Um, I saw a lot of common themes. So I think you're going to hear a lot of, you know, similar information from all of us. Um, and a lot of this isn't rocket science, right? It's, it's just kind of being mindful and thoughtful um, about what you're doing. Um, 
So anyway, when it comes to course design, um, some of this, some of what I'm going to say here is a little bit about my personal preference and what I would want to see as a runner <laughs> of a course. Um, so I want it to make sense. Um, and I say that to say, um, rather than getting caught up in this course needs to be, you know, exactly, you know, 31.00 miles. And so therefore, maybe you add in, you know, an out and back that adds a quarter of a mile, but someone goes down, they run around a cone and run back. Like, I, I think just kind of make things make sense and understand that in trail races, except maybe if you're doing a hundred mile race, there can always be a little bit of an ish in there. Um, and that's okay. So find find ways or maybe find a different loop to do, even if the course might be a mile longer than you intended. Um, I would prefer an extra little loop and a little extra distance rather than an out and back around a cone or, um, you know, just kind of something that that doesn't really make sense other than to just kind of add, add distance without the, the benefit of a view or um, a really cool site or something like that or tagging a peak or something. Um, and that kind of leads into highlighting the gems of the area. So typically when I, um, when I look at designing a course, I'm gonna look at a map of the area um, and it's an area that I know well. And so I might have a couple spots where I'm like, oh, there's a water, like my Mount Toby race that I run. There's a waterfall here that I wanna get. There's a cave that I wanna put runners through. There's a really gnarly climb that I think is really cool. So I start with kind of these elements of what do I want runners to experience out there? How do I highlight the amazingness of this um, particular location? And then how do I loop them together in a way that makes sense? Um, so getting back to making sense, but trying to make sure that we get from, you know, we get all these aspects that I want to get. Um, and I think of that also to just say, I know typically like I do travel and I do races, not just, you know, in New England. Um, and whenever I go somewhere, I always just trust that other RDs have that same thing in mind. No one ever says, well, that's the, you know, crummiest place I've ever run. That's really boring. That place sucks. Let me put a race there. Like they're also trying to highlight, um, the, the beautiful spots. And so, um, you know, making sure that that's every runner's experience. Um, and then just kind of from a logistical, you don't want runners to get lost, um, avoiding some of those overlapping or confusing intersections. And yes, you can overcome that with course markings, with volunteers, um, but as much as you can do to strip away that possibility that a volunteer gets it wrong, that a course marking gets removed, um, or that a runner just, you know, kind of does something stupid, um, you know, having a, a, a trail go this way and another trail go this way and having both of them on the race course, at some point someone's gonna get that wrong. And maybe the volunteer that's supposed to be there to direct it, maybe they have to go to the bathroom at some point and they're not there when a runner comes through or whatever. So trying to avoid those sorts of things or, you know, my favorite story is a friend of mine who went, you know, two trees off the course to go pee. Um, and somehow when she went two trees back, she ended up three miles earlier on the course because the two sections of the course were so close together that a runner peeing in the woods, which is something that happens, she ended up on a completely different part of the course. Um, those things happen. So make sure that like, if you have a place where someone might miss a really sharp turn, they're not gonna come upon your trail again, you know, a quarter mile down the tra trail or something where they realistically wouldn't see, they might see course marks and markings in that interval. So um, I think that's, that's my key factors. Brilliant. Amy, thank you. Thank you. And whoever would have thought we'd end up talking about peeing on course. I and mean, that's that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's ultra running, right? Like, it's going to come up at some point as well. You can't <laughs> avoid it. Oh, boy. Well, the first time I run, this isn't a trail race, but around London Marathon, um, that I made the complete rookie mistake of over drinking water before the race, the night before and the day and the day of the race in the morning. And uh, and, and I got to uh, um, uh, mile one and I was busting the pee. And and I was like, I don't need to stop and pee. I can just keep going. And I just kept going, kept going. And then I got to mile 13 and I was like, I ground to a halt by that time. And I pulled off, I literally, you know, they had porta potties and stuff on the route, but but I literally just pulled off because I was like, I cannot go anymore. <laughs> and pulled off on the side of a road and thankfully didn't get arrested or anything. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, yeah, peeing is important. Okay, so I think next I up. Don't, I don't know anybody else who would have run 12 miles needing to pee. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, would... I just... 
as, as you're telling that story, Terry, it reminds me if anybody's ever run Boston Marathon, it's yeah. maybe a half a mile in, there's a strip of woods and there's always just a line yes. of guys all peeing into the woods as all these yes. like thousands of runners go by. So yeah, yeah. waiting yeah. waiting 12 miles is amazing. <laughs> Steve, it, it, it was, I've done it once and I'm never doing it again. It was not fun. <laughs> yeah. um, Amy, Steve, I like well, how you said you know, it was a line of guys, not, not women. Not, no women, no, no. Women. No, it's always the they're guys. smarter than we are, Peter. It, Steve, oh, no, know. it's that the women have to go a little further into the woods because you, <laughs> you can't drop trow on the side of a uh, road in yeah. Boston. But well, you can, you can. Well, you are it. smarter, also. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I tend to agree with you, Steve. Yeah, next up. <laughs> yeah, so you know, Amy, as Amy said, we're you know a lot of the th the discussion points are overlapping because you know we all have experience and have found the things that kind of matter and how, how you how you pull it off. So uh, a lot of this is gonna overlap, but um, you know, having the reason to run, uh, whatever that reason is, whether it's a, um, you know, a historic route um, that you wanna showcase or a, you know, a beautiful section of trail, um, you know, uh, or a trans, transversing between two points or, you know, whatever the, your reason for run, running it, um, you know, I think it, it is key. Obviously, you want to, as a race director, um, give people that reason to run. You should want to, you know, if it was a race that you were going to sign up for, it, it would be something that piques your interest as well. So, you know, that reason to run is is key. Uh, the late great Matt Gunn was a race director, and he, man, at his races, he would he would give you the such beautiful places to run. Um, so that was his run, whether it would be a peak that you hit or, you know, a viewpoint or a story about the place. Um, and he didn't really care if you had to run through 12 miles of sand or through the worst trail that you've ever run across ever. He wanted to get you to these places. That was his reason to run. So, um, you know, whatever your reason is, know, know that. I think first and foremost, um, you know, and if you're designing a course, you need to, you need to start to figure out kind of concurrently as you're thinking about a course, the permit availability, you know, is there, are you running through wilderness or private property? Are you going to be able to, to pull a permit? Um, you know, different areas of forest service have different limits on number of runners. So realizing that, so that it kind of, Per permit availability and permit discussions go hand in hand with figuring out where your course is going to go. Uh, and then it's a little ancillary, but access for aid stations, um, you know, you don't want a 50 mile stretch where you can't put aid stations, or maybe you do, maybe that is what you're kind of after, but, uh, you know, most people, most race directors, I think, want to keep it to around 10 miles ish to between aid station. So you, you got to make sure that there's a way to get that aid station there. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Beautiful. Thank you, Steve. And uh, um, yeah, great reminder of, uh, of Matt, bless him. Um, yeah, the super guy and uh, much, much missed. Um, okay, so Peter, um, over, over to you, your, your, your top three. Yeah, again, I, I think there is some overlapping as we've all discussed um but um i i feel like my some of my um where i'm coming from is maybe sub ultra distance um and you know whereas um a 250 mile race director uh is you know going to take you 12 miles through sand uh to get you to a peak which i very much appreciate but um coming from a race director of you know maybe a 12 mile race or an 8k race um make sure it's runnable i think is is very important um and it, it's relative i mean you can send someone up a steep grade not everyone's going to run it but um for you know the people up front maybe they, they can run everything like pike's peak ascent for example um i would say some of the top elites run the whole thing and it, it's it's runnable um, but it's very difficult. But um, that that would be my um, my suggestion for for a, a sub ultra distance anyway. And um, the second point is um, be conscious of the local environment. Uh, 
I know Amy and um, Stephen both touched on it, um, permitting and getting approval from um, the local entities, whoever they are. But that doesn't always mean, um, you know, if they're not on site there, they may not tell you you're not allowed to go in a certain area and you cut across a, an, you know, a preserved area that only a certain type of owl in the world lives. And, um, and there are, I think Colorado is very good at this, um, being very aware and being present, the uh, management of where, what you can and can't do. But I know some race directors, um, so like Texas, for example, that once you got the permit, you can do whatever you want. You know, you can run across this cactus that's going to become extinct. Um, not saying that happens, but uh, I think just be aware of that and uh, maybe look at the park you're at and see if, if you're able to run or not run in certain areas. And then lastly, I think um, this is uh, back to Matt Gunn's thing is make it beautiful. I mean, the reason why people are trail running is because of nature. Um, uh, you know, it's not a road race, which is you're seeing road the whole way and street signs. This is, I, I think, take advantage of the area you're in. And if that means going through 12 miles of sand, then I think you should do it. Yeah, I, you know, another thing to point out that we didn't necessarily address, but um, we don't always get to choose, you know, th there are only certain trails or roads out there. And if you're going to put on a race in a certain place, you're, you're kind of, you do have maybe some options, but it's not an endless supply of, hey, I want this to be perfect single track here. And I want, I don't want any intersections. Like a lot of times I'll overhear somebody saying, man, I can't believe the race director put us on this trail. And it's like, well, you don't have endless options, but what you do is you make the choices that you're going to make, and then you make it a, 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 as as best as you can. Meaning, like Amy said, you know, assume that somebody's going to take the wrong turn, and so mark that, or put a volunteer there, or you know, whatever you're going to do, or let people know that it's this section's not runnable, or you know, whatever it is, because we don't we don't have endless choices of how the race gets designed. You only have a few. Yeah, and something like a 250 mile race is, you know, you expect not to run the whole thing and you ex you're going, you're doing it for the experience, I would say more so than anything else. So it's relative. I, I again, I, I reiterate that I'm coming from a sub ultra distance as opposed to a hundred mile or 250 mile. Yeah, yeah. That's, Pete, that's I like your, I like your comment about the being conscious of the local environment. I know like one thing that's come up for, you know, some of my races is like some of my races sell out, you know, Seven Sisters Vermont 100, it sells out and people want more. And at times some of the limiting factor is how many people can we safely run on a trail one day and not do irreparable damage in the long term? And so that's a hard decision to make because, you know, I've got a 200 person waiting list um you know for seven sisters and yet i have to stick with that cap knowing that you know we want this trail to continue to be beautiful in the long term not just for the short-term gain of an extra 50 people every year you know so i think that's a great point yeah yeah and that's a difficult decision to make because it means that you're not making that money <clears throat> yeah thank you good good conversation um, it's also a reminder for me, um, Peter, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you brought up about the sub ultra distances because especially if we have um, if we have race directors or event organizers that are maybe um, uh, new to the sport um, and, you know, so they're unlikely to be uh, uh, potentially jumping in with a hundred or a 250 um, race distance. So, so yeah, to start off with, you know, something like a 10 mile or a 10 K or yeah, 12 K or whatever. So, um, so that's a really good point. I think it's, uh, um, it's good to be uh, um, good to be cognizant of that in terms of uh, who we have listening in on the, uh, um, on the webinar. Um, the, the other thing is that just thinking about, you know, having, uh, um, having been in the, in the UK now for a few months is that there's, uh, um, there are lots of trails over here, but there's also lots of, uh, um, uh, lots of open ground um, where there are no trails. And, you know, to, to get from one point to another, you can take whichever route you want. Um, <laughs> and uh, even if it's over private land, right? 
even if it's over private land yeah yeah, yeah for sure um so you know it's uh, um and, and there's obviously places in europe where that's uh, um, where that's possible too but uh, um it'll be interesting to uh, um to if we could get some feedback from uh, other people listening from around the world um in terms of the specific challenges they have too um <clears throat> cool great stuff so that's a good start for design um so let's look move on to uh, um course markings and uh, steve you're uh, um, you're first up on this one yeah um you know it it goes hand in hand with um with course design you know whatever however you end up with what your what you want your course to be you kind of need to make similar decisions around course markings you know whether and it's probably going to be different whether it's a I know we're talking about running but mountain bike race or whether it's a you know a dirt road um trail race or whether you're single track or cross country uh or a shorter distance or a longer distance um so knowing you know knowing who your participants are going to be and what they're going to need for course marking i think is important um and then talking about that before the race what we have whatever your avenue for communication is with your runners um i think to mark to talk about how you're going to mark it um i think is important what you're going to use for markings and how often you're going to mark whether you're going to have positive markings or negative markings meaning marking where you're supposed to go and or marking where you're not supposed to go um confidence markers so marking every half mile or quarter mile or two miles or um and and you know putting that in the information for your runners is important um i also think uh, and this maybe has more to do with a longer distance race but consistent markings uh, many times the longer races we have multiple course markers taking sections of a course to mark um, and you know as a runner if you've done these longer races a lot of times you'll get used to a certain cadence of marking or a certain style of marking and then you get to a certain point in the course and it changes and so you got to kind of relearn what to watch out for so i think that's something that all race directors can uh, stem off by having training of your course markers and making sure that you have a consistent way that you're going to mark the course uh, and a discussion with your course marking crews um, you know to be consistent that way um, and then and I, I already kind of hit on this but decide on course markings whether you're going to do all pin flags or are you going to also have reflective marking or you're going to do all flagging tape um you're going to do chalk um you know decide on your course markings and then also uh having a weather contingency you know if you're using chalk or spray chalk and it rains what's you know what's your backup there um uh, and then also this isn't on here but um i do think it's important to have um an embedded runner or um you know, somebody running in advance of the runners, or at least being prepared um, to go out on the course and touch up sections, because there's always a section of the course that gets vandalized. I don't know what whether it's, you know, vandalized by uh, deer or cows, or whether it's disgruntled locals who don't want us on the trails or what, but, um, you know, being prepared for that and hopefully being able to get out and fix it before all the runners have come through. So that's what I would say, of course, Mark. It's usually humans, Stephen. Yeah, I hate to say it's beyond. <laughs> it's usually humans. Yeah, I know, I know. I like to give them the benefit of the doubt though. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good stuff, Steve, thank you. Um, so Peter, you're next, you're next up in terms of course markings. So uh, fire away, please. Yeah. I, the biggest thing I think is visibility. Um, I've, I've done multiple races where I'm, you know, just following what someone has told me to do. Um, and, you know, it may, may that be like a, a flag that's really up high in the tree or something that's on the ground level i think eye level is usually the best or close enough um very loud bright colors are are work the best you know if you're in vermont for example and it's springtime and you're using a sort of forest green marker it's going to blend in with everything all of your surroundings so fluorescent colors are are usually the best choice and um uh, the second point is um reuse of 
markings, flagging. I don't have a bigger pet peeve than disposing of things use after using them once. I mean, we live in a society where it's, you know, you get a, a paper napkin and a plastic fork and you throw it away. And then, you know, the next meal, you get the same thing, you throw it away. Um, and I, I saw a lot of it in, you know, some of the major groups I was involved with and it made my stomach turn because it's so much waste. Um, and there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, there's a sign company, uh, I'm blanking on their name. They're at the U.S. Trail Conference that they have, you know, directional markers and you can reuse them, Velcro things on. Terry, I, you probably have the name. Um, you're on mute. They're root, root arrows. Root arrows. I was yeah. going to say oh, route root. arrows. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Depends route. <laughs> British or America. Yeah. That's R O U T E A W R O S, and uh, um, and I'll share the uh, um, uh, I'll share the uh, the link for that on when I send out the uh, recording from uh, from this as well. Um, yeah, they're they've got some great ideas and uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, consistent marking, but in different in different formats as well. Um, right. um, yeah, I saw. Sorry, just to dive in, Peter. I saw somebody put up their hand. Um, and uh, um, uh, but I couldn't see who it was, and they kind of disappeared off the um, off the screen. So um, whoever it was, if they if you could put something in the Q and A, hopefully you can do that. So um, sorry, Pete, I can't go back on. Thank you. Yeah. So just reuse of um, markings, and I know like if you have hundred rolls of this plastic tape that you know you it gets tangled up, you're not going to use it that many times, but I think once you're done with those rolls, like just get permanent flags um, and markers and and signs. Um, you know, you can do that. It it's probably more expensive initially, but um, I I'm assuming both Amy and Stephen can attest it's it's worth it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a very important, especially for me. Just I, I you got to think that that stuff goes somewhere in the landfill and sits there for hundreds of years beyond our lifetime. So think of it that way and you will you won't throw that spoon or flag away next time. And um, the last point is um, humans are better markings than flags. I, I, they can speak back to you. They can tell you you're going the wrong way once you've passed them. Um, you know, I think a good course marshal is extremely important. And um, at, Amy touched on it, but having these people at specific and critical junctions, I think, is important. Yeah, that is my my two cents. Cool, brilliant. Thank you, Peter, and, and such a great reminder of that that reuse piece. And uh, um, you know, that that's something I think we're getting better at. Um, but there's still so much more we could be doing. Um, I think definitely room for improvement on that one. Um, so, um, yeah. I was going to say, while you're switching to my slide, I can say, you know, Pete, my uh, solution to, um, you know, using the flagging ribbing that we like to use is I tie it to clothespins. And then it's really easy to put up. It's actually much easier for the course marshal to pull off and they can be reused a ton. At some point that flagging does fade because it spends so many days in the sun. Um, but I have boxes and boxes of it in my storage unit. And that's what I use um, because I don't want to have to throw away reams and reams of um, right. survey, like, you know, survey tape. Yeah. yeah. And you don't pull the tree apart too. That's and you don't, yeah. And you're not taking a branch off the tree yeah. to get it, yeah. you know, to get it off. And, and frankly, even the course mar marker, rather than them having to like tie it onto a tree instead, it's, it's this quick draw, like you know, boom, you close pin, boom, you close. But I spend time in the winter as I'm like, you know, watching cross country ski races, making all of, you know, because somebody has to tie them on initially, or I give it to people that need their service hours for Vermont 100. Hey, great, here you go, make me a thousand flags. You know, the earth thanks you, Amy, the earth thanks you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so. Good. Good job, race directors. Um, so we do have a question now. Um, uh, revisibility. Um, important to consider the color of flagging and use cross hashing if possible on flagging. Individuals who are color deficient may not be able to see all flagging or easily differentiate colors in areas of course sharing. 
um, I think that's a really good, uh, a really thoughtful comment. And uh, um, uh, I don't know if that was who um, who put up their hand earlier, but uh, um, yeah, any uh, um, any ideas on uh, um, on, on that comment from from you three guys? Yeah, I mean, if you're using flagging tape, um, which you know, I, I agree, Peter and and Amy gave um, a, a really great way of how you can reuse flagging tape, but you can order it however you want. You can have polka dots or checkered patterns or um, you know, and that helps it pop with visibility and for folks that may be, um, you know, colorblind or color deficient. I, and I have, I don't know, somebody who is colorblind may be able to confirm or deny, but somebody told me that blue is the color that they can see most easily or that stands out against other things. Um, so mm. I don't know, at least that's what someone told me. I have no idea if that's an anecdote or a fact. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, um, Whoever it was that asked that asked that question, then uh, I hope that helps. And uh, um, yeah, really appreciate that's a, um, a thoughtful thing. It's uh, it's one of those things, isn't it? Where uh, um, you know, for uh, uh, well, I'm I'm certainly thankful that uh, um, that I'm not color deficient, but uh, um, but I'm sure a lot of people are. And so uh, um, yeah, thank you for raising that. Um, okay, so we'll move along. Amy. <laughs> well, and I think, uh, you know, Steve and Peter kind of hit my first one, you know, have a have a standard to mark and make sure that you communicate that with the participants. So I won't continue to beat that one into the ground. Again, common themes here. Um, my biggest tip, you know, overmark. Assume that a runner is maybe only going to see a half to a third of what you put out there. Um, and so overmark as if somebody's only seeing a half to a third of what's there. Um, especially if they're moving fast or especially if it's like a sharp turn or something like that. Um, so, so definitely overmark. Typically when I mark, I'll have somebody else right behind me that is kind of putting one in between each place that I mark. Cause I just kind of have a tendency to under mark. That's kind of my, my natural, um, way to do it. Um, so it's good to have, you know, to overmark, you know, nobody ever finishes a race and says, gosh, you know, you had too many markers out there. Let's talk about this. But they will let you know if there's not enough, you know, or if they went off course or whatever. Um, and then something that I've started to do, and this isn't universally possible at races, but if it is sharing a GPX um, file with your participants of the route, it's just another, another safety net. So it's not quite marking, but it's just another way to um, make sure that runners know where they're going. Um, you know, that being said, it's something like Vermont 100, we pass through 60 private properties. I'm not allowed to share a GPX file of the route. So it's not possible in every situation, but when it is, use that opportunity so that the runners have, it's, you know, they have belts and suspenders out there, so. Yeah, I agree with, with that. With all the technology that we have at our fingertips nowadays and our phones being such powerful tools, um, quite a few races, and I've adopted this as well, require that the participants have the GPX file downloaded to their phone, you know, and at check-in, you have to show it on your phone uh, as extra insurance. So um, I, I, I love that one. Good, good thought, Amy. Brilliant. Thank you, Amy. Okay, next, moving on to uh, course safety. Um, so kind of continuing on the flow. So uh, um, Peter, you're, uh, you're first up on this one. Yeah, well, I think the uh, one of the most important um, course safety topics is uh, is medical having um, medical there. Um, and I, I was actually at uh, Amy's race the Vermont 100 when there was a medical issue and uh, they thought someone's heart was arrhythmic or it was I, I don't remember who exactly that was. Amy, um, it was one of the top athletes, but um, the medical got over there really quick, and um, it was tense because I was I was right in the finish area. But um, I, I actually wonder if that was. I wonder if you're getting a different story because we actually had not one of the top athletes, but the pacer of one of the top athletes. Okay. Ultimately, was the person. So it wasn't somebody. You know, it was kind of this auxiliary person who probably spent all day not you know taking care of his runner and not taking care of his own needs and then he went out and ran tried to run 30 miles and this was the hot year in vermont um right yeah and ultimately he collapsed on the side of the trail and so we had to um you know it was a pretty serious situation but we had 
uh, amazing medical and uh, communication in place to be able to manage that situation. Right. And um, you, you are ultimately responsible for them as well, just by association, right? Even though they're not a paying member of the race. Um, so, I, yeah, I think medical is critical, even if a fan collapses or a spectator, a family member, um, it's good to have a, a medical on on standby. You know, if, um, I'm curious to hear Stephen's um, um, words on it because he's running a race that's multiple days long. So that's got to be a, a, a nightmare as far as coordinating medical staff and where you have them. Uh, but um, yeah, so medical, I, I think, is is very important. Um, and again, usually trail runners are are scraped knees, elbows, um, fall risk. But um, yeah, it could be more serious. And um, so the, yeah, the second topic is um, cutoff times. I was thinking about this, and um, I. It's good to see newer people getting into the sport and, you know, people that aren't um, a prototypical, you know, skinny, um, fit. Um, I think that's, that's great, but you do need to make sure that your uh, volunteers aren't out there for five extra hours than they're asked to be uh, because there's one person left on the course. So I think cutoff times are critical. I'm not just pointing out the people that are in last, um, um, you know, it, it could be for any reason. I know some elite runners who have just been leading and then blown up, sat in a chair and thought, oh, I can still make this cutoff time. And, uh, you know, that's also making people, uh, your volunteers who don't, who aren't paid, um, they're volunteering their time. I think that's, um, it, it's very, um, you have to be cognizant of their time as well. And um, make sure you have insurance, I think is, is very critical because um, things happen. I mean, uh, uh, sometimes they're minor, sometimes they're, you know, we're in a, a very litigious society where people like to sue others for, for nominal reasons. And, I think um, making sure you have insurance is extremely important. And um, I know there are a lot of races that have had trail races, ultra races that have insurance companies or providers like uh, RRCA or USA Track and Field. And um, ATRA does offer a um, trail mountain specific um, insurance. And I don't, I don't know if Amy and Stephen have that, but um, it, it's, it deals with factors that are more um, pertinent to trails rather than being out on the road and having, you know, coming in contact with cars. And um, so I think that's also important. And I think that my um, experience with this, whole, this topic in general is uh, my first mountain race ever was um, out in California. It's called Mount Baldy run to the top. And, um, there is um, an individual who finished the race and then you have to get down halfway down the mountain on your own accord. And um, he's, his heart stopped. And I, I think having medical is important, all of this, but we don't think about the, the, the trauma that it causes. I still think about that to this day. I, I was watching people give chest compressions to this guy who his heart had been stopped for 10 minutes before the helicopter got there. And, I, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure he didn't live. So, yeah, this is a course safety is very important. You know, that's that's something that just happens. You know, people's hearts stop. Um, he was probably glad he was out in the mountain. There, I've been sitting on a sofa, but um, yeah, just things to think about. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Good, good reminder. Um, so. Amy, so you, you had four key factors. I somehow I know. Did an extra one. It's, all, know. it's all good. I know. I like couldn't limit it down. Um, I'm gonna just quickly kind of speak to one of uh, Peter's point about you know runners that might be kind of towards the end of cutoffs. And granted, this this isn't gonna be 
every single runner's um, or every single RD's a-okay with this, but I actually offer people to have an early start. So I can still close the course on time, but if you're someone who thinks, like at Seven Sisters, um, I think you have to finish it in five hours. There are people that get really nervous about that. I think it's easier to allow them to be out on the course an hour earlier because by the time they're even a mile out on the course, I've got all my emergency people out there anyway. Um, and that still allows these people a chance to participate and, and lives within the cutoffs and the time restrictions that I have. Um, so I kind of just throw that out there as that might be a way to um, kind of sp split things a little bit to allow more participation, but also respecting people's times and stuff like that. And typically those people I say, look, the first aid station might not be set up by the time you get there. So plan, you know, plan to carry a little bit of extra stuff, but if they really need that extra hour, you know, they're, the lead runners will pass them at some point and everything else will be set up for them and they'll get support at the end of the race, which is probably where they more likely need it. So I uh, throw that out there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as, as we, as Peter hit on too, it's important to just um, engage somebody who's, you know, good at medical stuff, whether it's local EMTs or fire departments or, you know, emergency rescue crews or that sort of thing, whatever makes sense um, for the site. Um, so I don't have to linger on that one. Um, I think it's important to have a med kit at every aid station, which sounds pretty basic, but, um, you know, and yes, it takes up limited space in what you're giving to people, but make sure that you have a med kit, um, make sure that every aid station knows that there's a med kit. So the volunteers know that it's there, um, you know, make sure it has the basics to be able to manage the scraped knees, um, you know, ice packs for a sprained ankle, you know, kind of those basics, uh, feminine hygiene products, you know, all of these things that should just be, you know, basic and be out there. Um, I, we kind of talk, I'm going to talk about this a little bit in communication as well, but, um, oh, sorry. Nope. Just kidding. Um, I think Steve talked about this earlier about the distance between aid stations. And so, you know, again, aiming to have aid stations, um, at reasonable times and somewhat that's about getting the runner's support, but that's also about someone from the race checking in with every single runner in a way, right? So, you know, a hundred runners started at some point, you should know that a hundred runners went through the aid station at mile five, and then a hundred runners went through the aid station at mile 10 and that sort of thing. So, um, having them at reasonable, re reasonable intervals to have that check-in. Um, and then I'm a big fan of having a suite behind the last runner, um, not only for kind of safety sake, um, but also I use them to clear the course. So they pull all the markings as they go by, which means at the end of the day, when I walk away from the race site, I don't have to go back and, you know, there's not these days of, um, trying to get volunteers afterwards to help clean things up on the course. So, um, it's, they can kind of have a dual purpose, but they can also tell you, gosh, if that last runner hasn't checked in with the last aid station, they can tell you, gosh, we're half a mile out or we're two miles out. This person's barely moving. It might be a while, you know, so you can get that feedback. Brilliant. Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah. So Nancy, uh, Nancy, thank you for uh, um, adding this here um, in the Q&A that uh, um, uh, she's uh, shared a, a link for a checklist for trail race aid station preparedness. Um, and that's on the uh, trailrunner.com, so the actual website. Um, so I'll add that to the uh, the kind of link information that I send out with the recording of this session. Um, and um, Amy, there's a question here from uh, uh, Kimberly. Kimberly Orbishon, uh, good to see you out there and uh, um, hope you're doing well um, and having a good year. Um, uh, she says, how much medical personnel should you have on hand? Um, first responders or EMTs? Do you have them at start, finish? or through the course or both? Partly it depends um, on the course and you're probably gonna get a different answer out of you know Steve and Peter and myself. Um, and you'll even get different answers out of me depending on the race. Um, I think at minimum, you need to have somebody that knows medical, but the longer it, you know, the longer or more technical the race, the more you wanna have that accessible. Um, I'll say like for Vermont 100, um, well, we used to have much more, a much heavier hand with medical, but we now, if you're familiar with um, the Vermont 100, the Camp 10 Bear aid station is kind of in the middle of everything. And so we'll have medical at Camp 10 Bear with communication so they can kind of respond everywhere really quickly. And then at some point they shift to the finish line 
Um, or if we have, you know, a lot of times we have two ambulances, so they both start at Camp Ten Bear. At some point, one of them shifts to the finish line while people are still going through Camp Ten Bear, which is mile 50 and 70 of the 100. And then at some point they go to the finish line. But at something like Seven Sisters, I have people every mile and a half to two miles, I have the local um, like emergency responders. They access the course with gators um, and have somebody that's at least a wilderness first responder at all those checkpoints along the way. Yeah, and Amy, I'll just add to that. Um, I think, and I've directed the shorter distance, so the Bar Trail Mountain Race, for example, you're not really gonna get hurt going uphill. It's a steep climb, but coming down, people are going fast and there's rocks and roots. And so it's like immediate trauma when, when it happens. So, you know, we, I think we had medical up at turnaround point, six miles, and then at the finish. So if something happened, uh, maybe there was one at Bob's road, sort of halfway uh, on the climb and descent. And so I think, you know, it's usually falls and they can't get up broken bone, whereas um, being, I'm generalizing here, but the ultras, it's like, oh, my, my calves tightening up and they can make it five miles to the next aid station. It may not be fast, but um, yeah, it all depends on uh, speed and um, distance of the course. Mm. And there's also a question here, um, don't know who that's from, but how far apart do you typically station medical? Um, I guess you've already touched on that to some extent, Amy, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, I guess there's no hard and fast answer to that. I guess it depends. On no, I, I mean, I, I, both Peter and Amy said it depends. And I think that's, that's what I would say too. I would never put them at the start line. That's my, that's my one definite comment, but uh, yeah. Unless it's also course. your finish line. Yeah. Then I was going to say, I think I line. say start, but yeah, they're at the finish and they don't show up till <laughs> well after yeah. the runners have started. So yeah. yeah. But okay. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Thank you. Great questions, guys there. Um, so uh, we're going to move along. It must be Steve next um, in terms of course safety. So uh, um, Steve, take it away. Yeah, we've talked about a lot of great things. Um, uh, I will s s uh, touch back on one thing, cutoffs. So cutoff times were mentioned earlier. I think for a first year race though, it's important to educate definitely your volunteers that you may need to be flexible on your cutoff times because you know first year you're making assumptions and you know, if you've got 10%, 15% of the course behind cutoffs, you may want to readdress those cutoff times and adjust them. And having your volunteers know that in advance, I think is important. So anyways, want to hit that one. Um, so, you know, core safety and, and medical is hard to put hard and fast rules around. It really depends. Um, and you've got to just think through it and, um, uh, and come up with your best plan and then adjust as the years go by. Um, but one thing that I really like to do is know all of my access points, uh, evac and access points. And then, you know, like we were talking about earlier, you, you can have, you have a GPS device on your phone, recording all of those access points and recording them, whether they're, you know, ATV only, whether the truck or car, um, you know, and, and I have for myself, a, a, a GPX file that has all the access points for a course and the medical team does as well um you know and they're named and numbered so that they know um you know as you're um discussing how you're going to get somebody out you can uh, make sure you're all on the same page of of how how you're going to access them and where you're going to access them um, because sometimes we're running through really areas that are really difficult to extract somebody um and then it goes that goes into knowing how quickly to react. Um, you know, a lot of, we don't always get the best information from, um, you know, about a, an injured runner on our courses. It'll come from another runner that passed somebody or a volunteer at an aid station, but um, you gain this experience as a race director as time goes on, but um, knowing how quickly to react, you know, the things that, chest pain or heart issues you want to you want to go immediately um uh heat stroke you know if there's somebody collapsed on a course a major broken bone you want to go on all those things if somebody's 
you know, ankles hurt or scraped up, you know, Peter and Amy both said this, you may react a little bit more slowly and let them, you know, evac themselves or, or something. But, um, you know, being cognizant of when to go and how quickly is, is important. Um, training of your staff, I think, is critical um, so that everybody is on the same page of what your safety and medical plan is, uh, is important. Um, and then hiring a metal, medical team or, you know, multiple medical teams or local support uh, for the race um, is essential. And um, knowing where you're going to put them, what their timelines are, um, having meetings so that you're all on the same page, um, super important. Um, and uh, this really has helped me with some races, but GPS tracking. So if you're, it's very expensive, but if you're able to have GPS tracking on each of your runners, it's a very valuable tool so that you can look and see where every runner is on the course, if they've gone off course, um, you know, it's, it's really a valuable tool for, for, from the medical side. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, right, right. So we're moving on to uh, the final section now. So uh, course communications and we're, um, we're getting close to end time. So um, if we can move smartly through these uh, um, and Amy, you're, you're first up. Okay. Um, it's funny because I think we talked about a lot of this stuff already with safety and with some of these other things. Um, I, I find, I think, you know, Steve and Peter are going to talk a little bit about making sure that you have communication with aid stations. I think um, a great untapped resource for that is local ham radio clubs. Um, I know cell phones work in a lot of places, and so that's, that's great too, but um, these ham radio clubs, um, they have as much fun kind of running an emergency scenario and communicating and having a, an operation as we have at a race, like that is their playtime, um, is at least what I've found. Um, so I, I just kind of mentioned that as an untapped resource. Um, I got my ham radio license when uh, <laughs> when I took on Vermont 100 RD. Um, have a standard for what each aid station communicates um, and make sure that, they, you know, so you know, I want to know when the first runner is coming through. I want to know when the last runner comes through. I want to know when however many runners have come through, um, you know, or what, whatever the information is, make sure that they know this is the information that I want to have fed back to me. Um, you know, if, if it's something like, gosh, if a runner comes through and they're gonna continue, flag that person and communicate to the next aid station, hey, watch out for Biv 57. He wasn't looking that great, but wanted to continue. So the next aid station can check in, let you guys know if, you know, how that runner's doing. Um, so just kind of having them know what should be communicated is great. Um, and then, um, I don't know, I, I'm curious to hear what the other RD say about this, but um, I typically kind of have a standard point of contact that's managing all of this communication with the aid stations, and it's not me, um, because I get pulled off on a thousand different things. So I have a designated person in the start finish area that's kind of the you know, comms director for the day that's managing all of that. And then they can pull me aside or feed me the information I know, but I can be engaged in all the other things I have to do that day. Brilliant. Thank you, Amy. Good, good information. Steve, you're, you're next up on, on comms as well. Yeah, great. Um, so I, hams are amazing. Um, uh, they are extremely valuable when you don't have cell service on a course, but um, I think having a good uh, communication with your ham team or having, like Amy said, somebody else from your staff in on that uh, communication with the ham team is important. I have had races where the ham operators, they're so good and organized and have every scenario mapped out from, you know, sprained ankle to doomsday, but um, they will take over on their protocols unless you kind of like actually we're not going to do it that we need to handle it this way so uh, be cognizant of that it's a great resource um but um you know don't just let them operate on their own you really need to have your voice in on that um and then also going back and then i'll i'll go quickly because i know we're short on time medical polls if you have a medical team that maybe doesn't know running races their first instinct, especially on a longer race where a runner may be looking in very bad shape, they may want to pull the, a runner. But I think having a medical team that has experience 
or at least training and expectations of who you want to pull, who you need to pull versus who you're going to, you know, allow time to recover and get back on the course is important. Um, so yeah, determining your communication on the course, I think is important. Knowing where your cell service areas are and where they're not, um, where your cell services on EVAC, your EVAC points on the course uh, is really, will help you determine what your communication style for the race is going to be, whether it's going to be text or cell phone based or sat phone based or ham radio operators. So, you know, developing that is key. Having areas where you know you're not going to have cell service um, is fine, but identifying those and having a plan uh, it, it is great. For races that do have great cell coverage, I would highly recommend um, a, a text based platform for your race. SendHub is a company that I use a lot. Um, and it's a text-based system. You register a number. You can put that phone number on the runner's bibs so they can, you know, text any any issues that they see along the course to this to this phone number. It goes to a computer, and you can have a, you know basically a switchboard operator uh, dealing with communications where they send out information to all runners or all staff. Or um, it's a really great system. So, but that's only if you have good cell service. So, yeah. Fabulous. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate your uh, timing there. Um, Peter, last but not least. Okay. And so, um, yeah. If, uh, if I got minus it. one minute on I know, Greenwich I know. Mean Time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, back? I would just be reiterating what uh, everyone already said, but um, yeah, hams, they're more dedicated than most trail runners I know. It, it's pretty impressive. And um, yeah, Stephen brings up a good point. Don't let him don't let them do their own thing because they'll they'll start their own race within your race um and uh i guess volunteers is is a very important thing to me um these are people that are dedicating their time so um without much in return you know maybe they may get a, a shirt and some food but um really go out of your way to thank them i think just a genuine thank you um as often as you can is is important and um because you know some of them don't know what they're doing they're just out there and there's someone tells them point to the right and they're pointing to the right and um so you know it's the volunteers that are very committed it's it, they're they're rare and um i i would appreciate them as much as you possibly can so yeah, everything else was already touched on. Um, I agree with it. Great, excellent. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, we uh, haven't got any more questions. Um, so um, uh, yeah, I guess uh, um, uh, just remains to, uh, um, oh yeah, I'll just give you a quick update here on, uh, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me if you have any uh, comments or questions about the uh, uh, about this webinar. The next webinar is March 28th, and uh, um, we're going to be talking race courses again, but this time logistics, parking, aid stations, and spectators. So, um, yeah, I really felt that there's a, um, a lot of material here, and rather than try and squeeze it all into one hour, and as we've seen that it was impossible to do these four sections in one hour, um, then uh, made sense to overlap and have the, uh, the next uh, webinar on race courses too. So, um, yeah, thank you so much to, uh, um, to our panelists, uh, to, to Amy, to Peter, um, to Steve, um, really appreciate you uh, uh, sharing your time with us, and uh, thank you so much. I hope that uh, um, the uh, participants out there have found the information uh, that you've been sharing useful. Oh, having said that, oh, Nancy says great info. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Hi, Nancy. Hey, Nancy. Yep, yep. Um, so, um, yeah, well, take care, everybody. Um, uh, have, uh, um, have a great rest of your day um, back in the United States. Um, have a great evening in Europe uh, or wherever else you are in the world. And uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you for the next webinar, March 28th. Um, and, um, and hopefully for the uh, US Trail Running Conference, it's going to be returning to Makutio in Pacific Northwest um, and October the 18th to the 20th. And, uh, um, and I'll be sharing information about that with, uh, um, with those people that have registered for this webinar as well. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, uh, take care. Be well. Um, enjoy the trails. Look after each other. And, uh, um, yeah, let's look after the planet as well. 
and uh, um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the uh, uh, stop the screen sharing, and I'll stop the recording.